Okay, today I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, and I've talked about herbivory and systems in the past. What I wanted to talk to you today about was fossils and molecules. Uh, following on from John's talk, I mean, this is uh, work with Peter Cameron and Chris Godley, who did a lot of the heavy lifting in this, they did a lot of the work. But I want to present an overview of the, the evolution of fishes. Now, for me, when I think of Western Australia, it's one of the fascinating places because it has one of the oldest reef systems and one of the youngest in very close juxtaposition, a few hundred kilometers from somewhere like this. This is me a long time ago, not that long. <laughs> well, yes, okay. I um, this is somewhere, that's John Long with me, and he took me on one of these trips to look at the Gogol Formation in the Kimberleys. And this is an re ancient reef system, about 380 million years ago, there was a reef system there, um, a complex reef system, and it had fishes on it, and the fishes are still there. This is one of the nice things, this is what I went to look at. And that's a photo of me in the Back Reef Lagoon, and those are the fishes that are trapped in nodules and you have things like placoderms, they're basically like a shark with its head chopped off and a turtle's head welded on, and you've got a placoderm. Um, and these other things here are lungfishes. So the standard style lungfishes sticking their heads in the mud, and the one in the middle, that's a predatory lungfish. So these are the beasts that were running around those reefs 380 million years ago. And the, the question is, well, these aren't reef fishes. This is what you'd call a reef fish. I've said I've got a reef fish in a bucket, you wouldn't expect to see a lungfish. Um, but things were different. The modern kind of reef fishes, they were there, and this is one, this is Mimia, that's what it looks like in its nodule, and the, the beast itself, uh, top left hand corner, that's what it would look like in life. So that is the ancestor of all the fishes we see today on reefs, with the exception of sharks and rays and the like. So that's what it all started. 380 million years ago, there was reefs, there was fishes, and people kind of assume that fishes are just fishes. They're fins, they've got mouths on the front, they do the usual stuff. But nothing could be further from the truth. They've changed dramatically, and it's the way they've changed that gives us insights into the way that reefs and fishes have developed, what's happening in the, happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future. So the general assumption is that fishes would interact with the reef, but back here in the Devonian, those fishes seem to be totally indifferent to the presence of that reef. So they were fishes around reefs, but they weren't reef fishes. So the basic question is, what is the relationship between fishes and reefs, and, and how has that changed through time? So I want to look at a, a range of reef fish assemblages, and this is a series of systems where there's reefs and where you can find the fishes, and I've looked at these through time, and I want to understand not only the, the fish, but the nature of their relationships. Now, it's hard to do because the problem is that ecology doesn't fossilize well. You can get taxonomy from this, but you can't get ecology from it very easily. So I wanted to get the essence of what is a fish, what makes a fish a fish, and why is it really important. So here's a fish. There you go. And I wanted to pull from that what's really important. So I wanted to get out the key bits of that fish that make it something significant on a reef. So the key bits of fish are here. There you go. <laughs> All of the rest is a machine that takes them to a location. The eyeballs see it, the mouth grab it, and the anus puts the bits back. <laughs> now, I was shown this slide to Gary Ross and said, look, here you go, Gary, these are the important bits. And I looked at the bottom one and I said, the trouble is that arseholes don't fossilize. He <laughs> looked at me carefully for a short while, it was quiet, and he didn't say look in the mirror, Dave. He said I should get out more. <laughs> so, Putting the arsehole to one side, which is, is a, sounds painful in itself, but uh, <laughs> because we don't have fossils of them, I can't look at them, but we can look at the other bits. Those are the important ones. So eyeballs and mouths, and I wanted to evaluate a world of eyes and mouths. So basically, divided up fishes, you can have them, stylized, big eyeballs, and big or small mouths. That's the world of fishes. That's the, the basic choice they've got. And we can look at this through time. So these are characters we can pull from fossils. It's a bit like John was doing, but I simplify it. I've got two versions instead of multivariate ones. We can do it in a multivariate way, but it makes no difference. You get the same message out. So you can put it into this bi-plot. You can look at the fishes. This is a sample of fishes from the Triassic. This is what Chris was doing. He did it on modern fish and applied it to the fossils. And we can put real fish in there. So the one at the top there, that's, that's Brembodus. Now, 
what Brembonus is, is a, it's a pycnodontid, it's on the Triassic, and I'll show you the, another slide. Here we go. It's in the northern Alps, this particular specimen. They have these crushing jaws, they are able to crush things in, inside their mouths. This was probably the first fish to ever bite something from the surface of a reef. So it lived around corals, but it had the jaw morphology that enabled it to bite things off the surface. Prior to this, fish largely fed on the mud and things in it, or they fed on whole organisms in the mud or other fish. This thing was feeding on pieces of reef. So there was a major change. So as dinosaurs start to walk on the earth, this is the Triassic, first dinosaurs running around on the earth, first fish is taking bites out of the reef. So we're seeing a change in the way that fish interact with the reef, and we can measure it on that morphological bipod. And if it moves, there we go. And we can do the same kind of thing throughout time. So each time we get a slice of history in terms of what the fishes are and what they were able to do. Now what we see in this is a, a general pattern that there have always been fishes at the bottom, they're increasing in their extremities, but there's always been fishes with relatively small eyes that are biting other things. So small eyed beasts seem to have been quite widespread throughout time. What we see though is a progressive increase in these at the top in terms of those with big eyes. So you always assume that fishes are fish and they've always had eyes of a standard size, but they haven't. Throughout evolution, fishes' eyeballs have got bigger. But what the hell does a bigger eyeball enable you to do? Why would fishes do that? And the answer is, it enables them to see better. And what they've used it for, we start to see things like this. Those with a big mouth and a big eye are characteristic nocturnal feeding fishes. So there was an onset of nocturnal feeding. And what's interesting, it came about mainly in the Eocene. So at about 50 million years ago, there was suddenly an increase in these big eyeball feeding nocturnal beasts. And on the other side, we saw an increase in big eyeball, high precision diurnal feeding fish. So what we have is this increase in the abilities of fishes. So if you're a, a day feeder, a night feeder, or if you're on plants or small animals, big, elusive, tough, no matter what kind of organism you are, fishes at this point are able to catch you. So we're looking at an increasingly predaceous world and an increasingly interactive world between the fish and the reef. It's gone from just Brambodus taking a chunk out to a whole array of things being <coughs> day, night, precise, and otherwise. So reefs as we know it have been incrementally changing, and fishes have been there, and each step has seen a, a tighter and tighter relationship. <coughs> Once we get to here on the right-hand side, though, just after the KT boundary, the fossil record runs dry. And this is why we have a problem. If we want to get up to the present day, how are we going to fill in that gap? Answer is, we're going to use molecules. Now, cladograms are so familiar these days, I hardly need to explain what they are. Everybody seems to be using cladograms because they're a fantastically useful tool. This is your standard cladogram that shows the relationship between fishes. If you add a fossil calibration in there, you can also show the times the time scale, so you know the relationship between the fishes, but you also know when the major breaks were. So you can put it in a chronological framework, hence the name chronogram. Once you enter the field of bioinformatics, you can then start using various analyses and work out whether or not these breaks are statistically significant. So you can test whether or not radiations are more than expect from random. You can check whether, check whether there's correlations between features. You can now start to statistically analyze the trees and work out what was been happening in the past. That is what we've been doing. A quick example of it, um, ketodontids and coral feeding. There's a number of us from the Centre of Excellence working on this. There's 5,000 of fish of thereabouts feeding on reefs. 200, what, 128 of them are feeding on corals, and only 41 of those use corals as a main source of nutrition, which is kind of surprising. Corals are almost everywhere, but only 41 species use it for food. And of those, 25 species, that's 61% of the total, are butterfly fish. So in this one little family, they've really cracked coral feeding, and they do it well. So evolutionarily, the question is, how did they do that? It was one magical moment they worked out how to do it, and from then on, they've been really successful. So you can look at your trees and answer the questions, how many times did it arise, when did it arise, and what are the implications? So if you look at it, here's your tree, your phylogeny for uh, the ketodontids, and you see the ones in red are the ones that become coral feeders. And you can look at the age of it. 
And what you'll find is that it's arisen at least five times at different times over the past 15 million years. So coral feeding isn't a one-off. It's something that this group has repeatedly managed to do, and it's managed to do it several times. So did this explain why these were so successful? Well, we specifically tested it, and the answer is no. Coral feeding wasn't a really big deal. What was a big deal, however, was down here, and it was moving on to a coral reef. You assume butterfly fishes live on reefs. In the past, they possibly didn't. It's the move on to coral reefs that's something that seems to have underpinned the success of this group. So this is where Peter Cowan came in. He looked at this, he took it, and expanded it dramatically, and started looking at four families. So ketodontids with much bigger sampling, and apogonids, pomocentrids, and labyrinths. And the question was, what is it that has underpinned the evolution of these groups? And if you look at these, you find, now this is a lineage through time plot, so this is the number of lineages, it's measuring the spread of that tree through time. And the little dark dots are indicating specific clades within the cladogram that have expanded faster than you'd expect at random. So this is indicating periods of extremely good diversification. So what we see in here is there's a big region at the beginning where things seem to be doing well, but they're just asymptote off. So things just seem not to be going that well. And what this period coincides with, and this is what John was talking about earlier, is the hotspots were somewhere else previously, they've moved, but some of them have declined. So the death of the hotspot in the Tethys over in the top left-hand corner, that's where all the diversity used to be, as that hotspot died out, that is marked on here by these lineages starting to plateau off. They're not doing that well. But when the hotspot moved over to where we see it today in Indonesia, the Indo-Australian archipelago, this particular little hotspot, look at the diversification in each of these lineages. Every single one of them is starting to take off. This is a period of spectacular diversification, and it's associated with, it appears, a move over to this particular region. So what he could do then is he could do the stats and found that the diversification in these four lineages is higher if you're associated with a reef. So basically, living on a coral reef underpins diversification and biodiversity in coral reef fishes. It's a source of diversity. But he also found that if you simulate extinction, that you get higher extinction, sorry, higher <coughs> resistance to high extinction if you live on a reef. So if you're on a reef, you can survive even if extinction rates are high. So you get high extinction, survival, high origination, reefs appear to be critically important for supporting these groups. But if you start to look in more detail and you go in there and find out what are these things that are expanding, so these uh, little funnels are showing the, the expansion of certain groups, and if you look at them in detail, they highlight. What do these stars represent? What we're looking at is groups that seem to be associated with coral. A tight association with coral seems to underpin this relationship. So it's only early days now, but preliminary data suggests that there's rapid expansion, but we see it in groups that have close associations with Acropora. So in the Ketodontids, those that are associated with Apostolopora and Acropora seem to be doing particularly well. If we go to the Homocentrids, it's the Chromines, those that are associated with Acropora, that seem to be doing particularly well. If we go to the Apogonids, it is those that are associated with Acropora that seem to be doing particularly well. Time and time again, this Acropora seems to be jumping out and saying there's something special about this particular kind of coral and the diversification and the survival of fish. That seems to be a very, very special beast. The Acropora, not the fish. <laughs> so, what we're looking at in terms of the evolution of fishes, each step along the way, we're looking at tighter and tighter associations and the key to understanding this history is this set of relationships. The genes of our fishes go all the way back to the Devonian, but genes don't feed, fishes feed. And it's that interaction that seems to be important. So we see in this that the first fossil ancestor, the first bite from the reef, the first modern fish frame, the first herbivores, and all on we go. So why does this matter? Well, it's that Acropora seems to be an old relationship, and it's one that we're putting in danger. 
So today when we think of reefs as being vulnerable, they may be more vulnerable than we think because it's based on relationships that are forged 10 to 15 million years ago. Now, can you imagine a 15 million year old relationship? I mean, if you've been married that long, can you imagine how you'd feel? <laughs> <laughs> Give up the will to live, is that the answer? But, uh, <laughs> but today, a, a tropper is abundant, but it's vulnerable. Of all the things that seem to be susceptible to crown of thorns, bleaching, acidification, a tropper stands out. So it's worrying that the thing that seems to have underpinned diversification is the thing that's most vulnerable in today's reefs. So the message from history is that a cropper might be the key to diversity and what we're putting at risk when we lose it is old relationships. It's like the difference between real friends and Facebook friends. It's not the title that counts, it's not whether you're on a reef, it's the kind of reef that makes a difference. So that's the, what we've got to understand and for me as a fish worker it's really hard to stand up here and say corals are very special. And then, but they are, I'm afraid. It's a sad day, isn't it? So, <laughs> so when we look at this, I'm afraid the fishes are going into the background. It's the corals that are driving the game. And if I'm interested in fish, that coral has underpinned the origins of the fish and the biodiversity, the maintenance of the fish, and it's going to shape the future of fish. So if we want to know what's happening to the fishes, we've got to understand the corals and the relationships. Now it's early days, but it's not just coral cover or reef area, it seems to be the type of coral that matters and it, a cropper seems to be something special. So when we lose a cropper, we also lose a special relationship and we may be losing these relationships before we realise how important they are. I know it sounds like Bridget Jones' diary, but relationships really seem to be critically important and we've got to understand them because if we don't understand them, we're not going to understand the changes that are occurring on today's reef. So, the bottom line is, and the lesson from the past, is not just the corals, but it's the type of corals and the key relationships that they support that are critically important. With that, thank you. <laughs>